tonight. 24 minutes before 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. I really, really value the truth. I, I value it and I uh, try to um, adhere to always telling the truth. One of the things that I, I think our listeners has come to know about both you and I, Robin, is that we really do. And I hate to say I know something when I don't. And I hate to say, I, I don't even like when there's an advertiser and I'm supposed to say, oh, this will help you lose weight. You, you know, I don't do those ads yeah, because I don't think it does. I, I've, you've never heard me do them. And when we've had a guest who claimed he had a product that helped you lose weight or helped you cure anything, I will always say, you know, I'll always ask questions to indicate that I'm, you know, I am not the one saying that it does this. I'm just asking questions about it usually. Uh, in my relationship with my son, who is now 31 years old, I uh, made a commitment to him, to, to myself, to, for him, that I would never, ever, ever lie to him. No matter what he asked me, I would always tell him the truth. Exactly. And I can remember the day in the car after school, he said, do you believe in Santa Claus? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what I said was, um, I believe that there is something that happens around December that enables me to have several hundred more dollars than I seem to have. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's what Santa Claus is. And so I don't know if it, I don't know if it made him open up his eyes and said, oh, oh, okay, thank you for telling me the truth <laughs> or not. I'm not so sure. So I kind of have skirted the question. Um, but other than that, I, and isn't it funny that I, I, I kind of think of that as the only time I ever lied to him, but I didn't really lie to him but no. it, but it really weighed on me i'll be honest with you mm -hmm. uh ken dolan del vecchio is on the phone this is an interesting topic he's a family therapist a human uh resources leader an organizational consultant the founder of green gate leadership and he's talking to us about clarifying the value of truth the cost of lies my gosh we probably all have stories that uh fit into this category good morning ken what an honor to have you on our show Good morning, Larry. It's nice to be with you and Robin. And nice save about Christmas there. Oh, man. That was the hardest one. And, 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 th and thank God he didn't ask me about former girlfriends. That would have been... A <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. So where, where are you right now? I am in Palmer, Massachusetts, mid-central Mass, where I make my home. Okay. And, and are you a stickler for the truth? Have you, and have you always been? Absolutely. And if we don't tell our kids the truth, then where are they in terms of their grounding? And, and we've got a situation right now where the President of the United States lies all the time. <laughs> and in fact, in fact says, says one thing, and then a few months later, or even a little bit later in the day, says something entirely contradictory. And we need to give our kids it's called reality testing. We keep we want to keep ourselves and and the people around us connected to consensual reality. Well, if if you're bringing politics into it, I, I can't think of a president who hasn't lied to us. Well, I think that that's true, I, and I certainly agree. It's just that that these are so obvious and so continuous and so obviously counter to our own ability to observe. So for example, when we hear the president say that it's the biggest crowd in history at the inauguration, and all evidence is to the contrary, or we hear him say that three million people voted illegally when all the research shows that an infinitesimally small number of people do that, yeah. we've got some explaining to do yeah, those to are, our kids. Those are two, exactly. Those are two very embarrassing statements that I, I wish he hadn't said, but uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, so did you write a book about this? I did. My book is called Simple Habits of Exceptional But Not Perfect Parents. And it addresses a whole bunch of different ways that, that we as parents can help our kids to feel empowered, to help them to think through and navigate the world. It's a very complex world, can have very strong esteem, can respect others, and just things we can do every day. Really, the way we live our lives yeah. is the model. It's the primary Absolutely. model for yeah. our kids. You know, and, and I wish what you just said uh, for parents in their relationship with their children could be adhered to by elected officials and the people they supposedly represent. That would be the ideal. Don't ask me why. I don't know that. Why is it that we see this 
in our candidates, but yet we vote for them anyway. <laughs> Why is it that we see like this guy, this guy in Alabama, this guy now, what's his name, Moore? I mean, come, come on, you see that the guy has lied. And I'm not playing politics here, by the way. I'm just telling you, if the guy disrespected people in the past, how do we respect him to make laws on our behalf? I, I, I'm as baffled as you are by this. I, I do think, however, that what you said is very important, that mm -hmm. in every human system, mm -hmm. starting with our families, we look to those who are in position of authorities as the role models who set the tone and set what's okay and what's not okay. And so I think this is a very dangerous moment. And I, I am baffled by the fact that people will somehow argue that a person's position on legislative policies overrides the likelihood that they've, that they've committed crimes. Right, right, right. And, and then you, you also address issues on how to talk to children of different ages because that's very important too because when you're you're uh, really really small and you're used to safe environment all of a sudden this fear is creeping in like you know is my teacher gonna do this to me like somebody did to somebody else yeah exactly and one of the things that we need to teach our kids very early on is that they are sacred that their bodies are sacred and that they own their bodies absolutely and if anybody touches them in a way that they feel uncomfortable with they have the right to say no and that it's really important that they tell their parents about it yeah absolutely. and in fact if it if it happens that it is their parent then they can tell their other parent, they can tell a grandparent, they can tell another person who they trust. Very, very important thing to let our kids know. And, and in this situation, to let them know that this, what we're seeing in the news and other kinds of bullying right. happen at all ages. I have, and it's not okay. I have a question for you, Ken, as a therapist. Um, mm -hmm. Comment on this. What is the difference in development of, let's say, let me just use a young woman, if, if I could just gen genderize it, I guess, a young woman who doesn't tell right away as opposed to the one who keeps it under her, you know, keeps it a secret for, for decades. What, how does that hinder or help, not help, I guess, but how do, what effect does it have on her development? Well, it's a great question and it's very common actually for the latter to happen. It's very common for a person who has been sexually abused, actually from either gender, to, to not reveal that for a very long time. And, and the reasons are, are many, but one of the key ones is that, that we, tend to, we tend to freeze when that kind of assault happens. So when a person is under immediate stress, there are three potential behaviors that usually happen. They are to fight, to flee, or to freeze. And many times when a person feels like they, they cannot escape the situation and they cannot overpower the aggressor, they'll do the latter. They'll, free, they'll essentially play dead. And mm. that happens emotionally as well. That colors their emotional experience. And that being the case, they will, they will just sort of put that away because it is too painful, and the thought of it is, is something that they, they don't want to go near. Another thing that it's important to keep in mind is that children tend to feel responsible for the things that happen to them and around them. So, for example, to, to take a, 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 different, a different kind of an example, when a child experiences a loss in their life, if a parent dies, if a sibling dies, mm -hmm. it's really important for the parents to make sure to tell them, you had nothing to do with this. This is not your responsibility in any way, shape, or form. So that's a couple of the, yeah. the dynamics. And I think what we're seeing is that there's, there's this, this surge of revelations, and it reawakens in the minds and hearts of those who have experienced something similar, their own experience, and they're like, I'm gonna jump in and lend support and tell my story too. I, I, I love what you're therapy. saying. Uh, could you repeat the title of your book, please? It's called Simple Habits of Exceptional But Not Perfect Parents. And how do we... And, and there's one other... 
that you can get it on on Amazon. You okay. can get the hard copy or the the Kindle copy. There's one point that I want to make. It's important for parents to talk with their kids about what's going on right now, even if their kids don't bring it up. Because if you don't bring it up, they default to whatever their wow. immature fantasies may be or what their peers are telling them, which may be worse. Might be worse. Yeah. And there's one one other quick comment I want to make. Do you remember Mr. Rogers? Mr. Rogers Absolutely. neighborhood yeah. said <laughs> So one of the most important things, and I use this quote all the time, that he said was, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. Oh, I like and that. And if, if we can talk about this, it immediately becomes less frightening. If we can give words to it, if we can have a conversation about it, it immediately becomes something that we can, we can deal with. So it's very important. Some really good advice. So uh, let me squeeze in one uncomfortable one. Ready? Uh, okay. Your brother has a child, and he asks you if there's a Santa Claus. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know what? You know what? I told my kid asked me this too. He was about eight, and what I said to him is, I said, Eric, <laughs> Santa Claus is the spirit of giving. And that's why <laughs> we have that story. And you know what his answer was? Huh. His answer was, so you and mom are the tooth fairy too, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love that. That's great. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love this conversation. Uh, Ken Dolan Del Vecchio. Am I saying your name right, Ken? Ken Dolan Del Vecchio. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Thank you so much for being on the air with us. Ha um, have a great holiday season yourself, and, uh, and thank you. Uh, I love what you've said. I, I wish I could disagree. It's sometimes more fun to disagree with a guest, but, but in your case, I'm agreeing with what you're saying uh thank you Ken. okay thank you so much for the time to speak with you and your viewers or your listeners oh you are certainly welcome and definitely come back anytime we will be right back ourselves